Hey, my name is April Cassidy. I'm the peaceful wife and the peaceful mom, and I'd like to invite you to be peaceful in Christ too. Today, I want to talk about the purpose of marriage. What is God's purpose behind marriage? And anytime I talk about any subject, I'm going to refer to God's word, the Bible, because I don't have the authority to decide what's right and wrong. I don't have the authority to determine what marriage is. That's God's prerogative because he created us. He created male and female. He created the institution of marriage. So if we're going to understand marriage, we need to understand why God created it and his primary purposes for marriage. He intended marriage to be a picture, a living parable of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his people, the church. We tend to think of the church as a building where people who call themselves Christians meet on Sundays. But to Jesus, the church is his body. They are the people he has chosen out of this world to be his own, and we have chosen him to be our savior and Lord. So the incredible thing about marriage is that it reveals an eternal mystery, which is the way that Jesus relates with such tenderness, humility, kindness, selflessness, unconditional love, gentleness, protection, provision for his bride, the church, and the way that the church relates to him with honor, love, respect, cooperation with his leadership and devotion. Paul describes each of the people in the church as being part of the body, like one person might be a hand and one might be a foot and one might be an eye. So we are different organs or parts of the body and we work together with the head of the body, which is Christ, to accomplish the purpose and mission of God. Jewish marriage traditions and customs from biblical times parallel so closely with the relationship between Jesus and his bride, the church. And so I have a link to my post on my blog, peacefulwife.com about this topic. And also I have a number of other links that relate to this topic as well there. So you can check out more information there. In biblical times, the Jewish bridegroom to be would speak to the bride's father and he would offer marriage through the father. Today, a man buys a ring and proposes to the girl he wants to marry, and then she responds to him. So the man initiates, usually, although I know that's changing these days, but historically, the man initiates the proposal, and then the woman can accept or reject it. And it's the same way with us and Christ. He came to our earth, as Jesus. He was God in the flesh. And there's only one God. He's the creator God. He's the God of the Bible. And he came as a human to be God with us. Emmanuel means God with us. And he came to propose marriage to us and to rescue us from the dire straits that we were in. So he initiated the contact. He initiated the potential marriage covenant. And it is up to us whether we accept it or reject it. Jesus came to earth and paid a great price for us, inviting us to come to him and enter into an eternal covenant with him. He followed the pattern of the Jewish marriage covenant traditions in almost everything that he did for us. He even used the same words that a Jewish man would use to propose to his bride and what he would say to her was this, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and welcome you into my presence so that you also may be where I am. John 14, two through three. That was a Jewish wedding proposal that the man would say to the woman. And that is exactly the invitation Jesus gives to us. Another thing that is a parallel is that there's a name change for the bride. A bride takes on the name of her husband. When we come to Christ, we receive a new name, the name of Jesus Christ. We become Christians or Christ followers. 
and we have a new identity in him. Another parallel is that a bride has a new home. She leaves her father and mother and she goes to live with her husband. So the man and wife have a new home together. Traditionally in the Jewish culture, in biblical times, the man would add on a room to his father's house and take his bride to go live with him there. But even today, a bride leaves her home and starts a new life with her husband. Jesus will also come and get his bride and take her to be with him in his father's house. It's called the rapture. We either go to be with him when we die and leave this world that way, or when he comes to rapture the church before the great tribulation, we will go to be with him. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. The marriage covenant is to be a lifelong covenant, and it represents the eternal covenant that there is between Jesus and his bride, the church. One man and one woman enter into a lifelong covenant to be there for each other for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Jesus, God in the flesh, the only true God, and his bride, the church, have an eternal covenant, so it's not going to end when we die. It will go on for eternity. Historically, if a groom would go to the bride's father and pay a large substantial sum of money, a bride price, to the father of the bride so that the groom would be able to take the bride for himself. This demonstrated how he valued the bride to be, how much she was treasured, that he was willing to sacrifice greatly in order to have her, and that she would legally belong to him. She would be his wife. Jesus sacrificed greatly for us too. He paid our sin debt, our massive sin debt that we owed to God with his own blood and his own life on the cross. God became a man and lived the perfect life that we could not live and died the death we deserved in order to make a way for us to be able to be in right relationship with him. He came to rescue us from death and hell. A covenant is so much more than just a promise or a business contract that could be easily broken. It is intended to be binding until one or both of the spouses die. Jesus has offered us an eternal covenant through his blood on the cross. The new covenant, which is vastly superior to the old covenant of Moses from the Old Testament. That fellowship and relationship that was lost during the fall when Adam and Eve sinned is now restored through the new covenant. Another parallel in the relationship in marriage and the relationship with Jesus and his church is that there is selfless generosity and joyful receiving for both spouses. A man takes on the position of protector, provider, and giver in many ways to his wife. Today, a wife may also contribute financially. We have a lot more freedom to do things like that today than many women in the past. For many women, they had no means of financially providing for themselves and they were dependent on a husband to provide and sometimes it's that way still today. Even now when wives can provide for themselves, husbands still tend to feel a very deep and profound calling or desire to provide financially for their families. You can check out For Women Only by Shanti Felden for more about this. But this is a picture of the way that Jesus gives and provides so generously for us. We are dependent on him and he provides for our physical needs, he provides for our spiritual needs, and we joyfully receive his provision and we are grateful for his provision. Both spouses in a marriage give of themselves fully. They give themselves physically, sexually, financially, emotionally. They give of themselves completely to the other. And that's what we do with Jesus spiritually. He gave all of himself for us. Now we give all of ourselves and our lives for him. Another parallel is his strength for her honor. A man is generally much stronger than a woman, which is a picture of how Jesus is so much stronger than we are. A man uses his physical strength to defend his bride from danger, to protect her and their children from evil, to build a home for his wife. He values and cherishes her. She is, according to scripture, the weaker vessel, but she is equally precious in God's eyes. So it is his job to use his strength courageously for her good. 
He honors her by fighting for her and their family in ways that she cannot fight for herself. Jesus, too, uses his vastly superior strength to save us, to rescue us from danger and harm and evil, to protect us and to defend us. He fought for us in ways we could never fight for ourselves. We were the damsel in distress, and he was our hero. Marriage is also a place of sanctification. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33 talks about that. We can't hide our sins and flaws very easily in marriage. Our motives, thoughts, expectations, words, and deeds are exposed. And so this is an opportunity for us to repent from sin and turn to Christ and say, I can't do this by myself. I need your help to be the woman, the man you call me to be. Jesus takes on the responsibility in the new covenant to present his bride to himself without stain or wrinkle or blemish, and he cleanses his bride with his word and makes her holy. Another parallel is the access and authority that she receives. So in a marriage between a man and a woman, the bride enjoys access to her husband's property, his finances, any inheritance he may receive. Jesus' bride also enjoys access to all that belongs to him. She has access to his spiritual riches, access to his provision, access to God the Father, to the Holy of Holies, to his authority. We are co-heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17. Another parallel is oneness. The one flesh relationship of marriage depicts the one spirit relationship that Jesus desires with his church. In marriage, part of the husband's body enters part of the wife's body. They become one flesh. Their love and oneness brings about fruit, babies. This is a holy thing that God intended only to be done in the context of marriage. In our relationship with Jesus, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and part of God's Spirit comes to live in us and dwell in us, and we become one spirit with him. We are to be filled with his spirit. Spiritual fruit results from this, the fruit of the spirit, in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Also, part of the fruit of having the spirit living in us is that new believers are born into the kingdom. As we share the gospel and as we mentor and disciple people and, and as God's spirit and love and truth flows out of us, new Christians are born and come into the church. Another parallel is that faithfulness is required and expected. In an earthly marriage, the man and woman are expected to be faithful to each other, to only have sexual intimacy with each other and with no one else. If an earthly spouse cheats on the other one with someone else, it is called adultery. And in the Old Testament, that sin was punishable by death. That is how serious it is. To God, idolatry is very similar to adultery. So if we put something or someone else on the throne of our hearts, we worship someone else, we depend on something or someone else for our spiritual needs instead of him, we find our identity and fulfillment in someone or something else, then we are committing idolatry and to him that is unfaithfulness. And his new covenant with us depends on his faithfulness, which he is always faithful to us. We are to be faithful to him. Marriage is to exalt and portray the gospel. Everyone should be able to look at us, our children, our neighbors, our coworkers, other people should be able to look at our marriage and see an accurate picture of Christ and the church. God designed marriage to showcase this interplay between masculinity and femininity as part of that picture. The husband is to represent the sacrificial love, humble servant leadership, strength, and devotion of Christ to his bride. The wife is to represent the love, honor, cooperation with his leadership, and respect that the church has as it relates to Christ in the way she relates to her husband. Of course, in a human marriage, there are going to be some limitations because Jesus is perfect and he is deity, and human husbands are not. All of us as humans fall short. But still, the goal is we are to portray this picture. 
The husband and wife have equal value in God's eyes, according to Galatians 3.28, but they do have different roles. In God's economy, a person's value and worth is separate from their role or their position of leadership. So if God values an unborn baby or a new baby or someone with Down syndrome just as much as he values the president or a leader of a corporation, our value does not depend on our position and our level of authority in God's kingdom. In fact, if anything, God values those who are weakest and most powerless, and he puts people with greater strength in positions of leadership to protect them and to care for them and to shepherd them. And then the last parallel I'm going to talk about in this video is fruitfulness. God designed marriage to be the primary building block of society, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. And it's the place where godly children are supposed to be born and taught and discipled and raised. Malachi 2.15 So then the children can model themselves and their future relationships after what they saw their parents do. God's goal is that the children will grow up loving God, loving people, treating others with love and respect, and that they will have a healthy, flourishing society. The church also is supposed to produce godly offspring. The Holy Spirit works in believers' hearts to reach unbelievers and new Christians. New baby Christians are born into the kingdom. And then it is our job to, as the church, to disciple and mentor and raise these baby Christians to know the Lord and to live for him and then to set godly examples for other people. All of this is why we can't just change the definition of marriage to be politically correct or because of a current popular trend, because it is not our place to define marriage and it is not our place to alter marriage. When we alter it, we skew the picture of the gospel. Marriage is holy because it pictures something that's holy, and it is supposed to produce holy people, holy husbands, wives, children. Of course, there are many other good purposes in marriage as well. Companionship, romance, emotional connection, financial stability, spiritual refinement and growth, health benefits, much more benefits to children in so many ways and stability for society, etc. But I wanted to share some of God's biggest purposes and those parallels between marriage and the relationship between Christ and the church to help us see how holy and beautiful and powerful God's concept of marriage is and how important it is for us, as far as it depends on us, to honor his design. Thank you so much for watching. You can also find me at my blogs, peacefulwife.com and peacefulsinglegirl.com. And I hope you will choose to have a peaceful day in Christ.